we have a lot of veterans in our movement in the United States that uh, if one is to be serious about waging peace, one has to take similar risks that soldiers take in the waging of war. We um, cut our way into the uh, airport and then made, I think it was like 300, 400 metres um, up to the hangar and we had thought there was an entry to the hangar uh, but when we got closer it ended up being a generator. So we kind of looked around and um, found a door with two narrow windows either side so we took those windows out and we were in a corridor, there was another door which we assumed would be locked but uh, it was unlocked and then we um, made our way to the US Navy warplane that had been completely repaired that afternoon and uh, began to disable it with uh, hammers. We worked on it for about six, six seven minutes. Uh, there was a police vehicle parked in front of the car and a police officer, so he called for backup. By the time the backup arrived, we'd finished disarming or disabling the plane. Yeah, they had deployed special branch with Uzis following Mary Kelly's action about four or five days earlier. Um, and we'd obviously lost the element of surprise. My memory was coming through that door and just seeing the plane it had a big map of Texas on it. And I, I'd served nine months in jail in Texas, so I just focused on this map of Texas. And um, I was hammering on the plane and Damien was hammering next to me. Then I noticed Damien wasn't with me and I, I looked around and saw a police officer for the first time hanging on to Damien. So I went over and and kind of tried to calm him down and uh, and just kind of nodded to Damien to get back to work and then we both began, uh, continued working on the plane. To render it unflyable is relatively easy. That, that plane, I, I was quite surprised how porous it was. I knew the radar was um, at the nose, so I worked on that. Yeah, it was two and a half million dollars in six minutes, which isn't a bad effort. The Catholic worker is is primarily United States, over 200 communities. It began in the 1930s by a woman who was an anarchist and a suffragette who became a Catholic, Dorothy Day. Two of the hammers we used at Shannon, we had used on the B-52, and as I often say, they've got such respect for private property, they give, keep giving us this stuff back. And then one of the hammers uh, was sent to England and uh, was used on British aerospace on equipment that was being sent to Indonesia to use in East Timor in the early 90s, but also equipment that was being sent to the north of Ireland, I understand. And Chris Cole used that, and then he came out of jail and gave the hammers to four women who disabled a Hawk fighter. I think it was two million pounds. Then the hammers were passed on to the priest I lived with in this house, and he disabled the nuclear convoy vehicle that's designed to carry the warheads from Aldermaston where they made up to Fast Lane to the Trident submarines. And then they kind of, this hammer then came back to me and I took it to Ireland. I, I'd, I'd previously served 13 months in US prisons for disarming a B-52 bomber at the, um, on the eve of the first Gulf War. So I think the war on Iraq really began with that first Gulf War and then continued through the 90s with the sanctions. I guess what the B-52 is a delivery system, they're not the bomb. So disabling them can be quite simple really. The, the one we disabled in New York when we engaged it was on 20 minute scramble alert and also had nuclear tip cruise missiles on it. And then when we came to trial, we discovered it was taken out of action for two or three months. I mean, we were expecting three to five years and we got a year um, we were convicted of criminal damage and conspiracy. I was put on Con Air and flown to the outback of Texas, initially to El Paso and then bust into the outback. And that was very difficult prison conditions. There were 24 of us in a cage, six cages welded together in one room. I was the only white prisoner in the jail for most of the time. The first month I found very, very difficult and um, I was getting a lot of harassment from guards, many who were um, National Guardsmen or in the Reserve <coughs> uh, who didn't like the look of me and didn't like my politics. And, um, uh, and I was getting a certain amount of harassment from other prisoners. And then what, what really saved me was the amount of correspondence. I, I think I received like 1,700 letters in nine months. So as soon as that came in, the guards backed off and I got kind of popular with stamp collectors. There's obviously a lot more firearms around a US military base in New York and there would be a civilian airport in Ireland. Um, 
and we had that group had been in preparation for over six months and we were taken away different secret location every second weekend for the weekend to prepare for that action and we had discussed uh, the fatality issue if someone was killed here we live at Giuseppe Coleman House and then the themes are the acts of mercy and here at the moment we're offering night shelter to 23 destitute refugees other Catholic workers have AIDS hospices or do prison visitation or soup kitchens. And then the third theme is non-violent resistance to those institutions that create poverty. Do you have a checkered past? Well, I was trying to get an explanation of what that phrase meant. <laughs> and it's been uh, fairly open and consistent, I think. Um, uh, yeah, I'd like to know what they meant by it, basically. <laughs> Yeah, that came from an Australian uh, radio interview, I think, and uh, when I was back in Australia. I mean, the role, me and uh, the, the former, the, or the veteran of the wars had with Julian was to get him safely into court and safely out of court in this whole kind of media mangle of people trying to get a freak out shot of him looking depressed or startled or whatever. So that was our kind of physical security role and to get him into high court, Supreme Court, etc. So that kind of got inflated to a kind of Whitney Houston bodyguard kind of thing. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wasn't raised a pacifist. I was, you know, came initially out of an Irish Republican tradition and um, into the left in Brisbane and then found this praxis that I could relate to. So you don't know what the consequence of any action you do is going to be or what the ripples out will be and sometimes they come back and you learn because Ireland was going through this major paradigm shift of, of being a neutral country to servicing this imperial war machine. So most US troops that went to Iraq went through that very small departure lounge including Bradley Manning.